Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday LumCon Science Talks. I'm so glad um, all of you could join us tonight. We still have people. <laughs> we still have people joining in and uh, and coming in at the last minute. So while we're waiting for everybody to kind of sign in and get settled, um, just a few reminders for those of you who have attended in the past uh, and instructions for those of you who are first time attendees. We will be monitoring the chat and the questions as um, you ask them. Hey, thanks, Ross. We got a LumCon is amazing. That's a great way to start a Thursday talk. <laughs> Glad you can make it again. So if you haven't used the question box um, and you want to practice, now is the time. So let's see. If you want to let me know who your favorite superhero is, we'd be really curious to know who your favorite superheroes are. So send in those answers um, so you can practice with the question box. Hey, Christoph, nice to see you. <laughs> we have a Darwin as a favorite superhero. That is awesome, Lindsay. That's great. Aw, Janet, that's so sweet. Jeffrey likes Thor, Wolverine. Excellent. No Aquaman yet, Craig. I'm really disappointed in that. <laughs> I'm, I'm very disappointed in the lack of Aquaman as a suggestion. Anthony just said Aquaman is his favorite. So we do have a <laughs> powdered, powdered Toast Man. I've never heard of Powdered Toast Man. So I'm a fan of toasts in all forms. <laughs> <laughs> we do like some toes. <laughs> oh, we got a favorite superhero is Solomon Damon. Wow. <laughs> He's got to be one of my favorite too. All right. Well, it seems everybody is capable of using the question. <laughs> this is awesome. I like this. So I am going to turn it over to you, Craig, uh, for your introduction of tonight's speaker. See you later, Thank you people. so much, Hart. I appreciate it. No problem. Well, good evening, everybody. I hope I find you and your family and friends safe and in good health this evening. I'm Craig McLean. I'm the executive director of LumCon. And I'd like to thank you for joining us again tonight for our ongoing talks in the LumCon uh, online science series. Every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central, we're inviting a Louisiana scientist to share their research and we'll give you the opportunity to listen and ask questions of some truly amazing people doing some ex truly extraordinary science. And I hope you will continue to join us each week as we explore more of our world from the comfort of our homes. Now you can find more information about the complete series at our website, LumCon.edu. Just scroll down on our homepage of the link under news and events. Well, tonight it is really my privilege to introduce Dr. Kelly Robinson, an assistant professor at ULL, uh, University of Louisiana Lafayette, and a very good friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Robinson is from Tacoma, Washington, and is proudly a third generation Robinson to work on the high seas. She completed her undergraduate at Sweetbriar College, an all-women's school in 2004, received her master's in fisheries and aquatic sciences from the University of Southern Florida, and then went on to achieve, achieve her PhD in marine sciences at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab from uh, the University of Southern Alabama. Dr. Robinson worked as a postdoc at NASA Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, Hatfield Marine Science Center in Oregon, and she's currently an assistant professor of biology at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, as I mentioned, as well as an expert uh, oceanographer uh, and an expert in zooplankton, uh, particularly jellyfish. So I will turn it over to Kelly tonight. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Craig, thank you for that wonderful introduction and my welcome to everyone who is uh, joining us live. And for those of you who are looking at this as a recording, uh, welcome as well. Um, so, I'm gonna hide myself, figure out how to do that. Bert, how do I hide so I don't see myself? <laughs> <laughs> you can just turn off your webcam. Oh, okay. All right. Stop sharing my webcam. All right. 
There we go. We're figuring out the technicalities of this. All right, everyone. Well, welcome to my talk. Um, I am taking a listicle version. Um, if you're a BuzzFeed fan, you know BuzzFeed is famous for their lists. And so that is the format uh, that I attempted to set up for tonight's talk. So focusing on 10 ways microscopic animals are fascinating. And we're gonna see some of them are not quite microscopic, but they're all some form of plankton. So what is plankton? Well, to quote my friend, Dr. Beth Stauffer, it is a lifestyle. Uh, it actually comes from the Greek planktos, means for errant or wanderer. Um, and there are many different types of plankton. So there are bacteria and archaea, protus, which includes our phytoplankton. And then the group that we're gonna focus on today are the animals, the animal plankton, which are called the zooplankton. Now, this is a really diverse group. Um, and this slide that I'm showing you here just is intended to kind of demonstrate the, the diversity of different types of animals that we see in our, in our zooplankton. So you can see that they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And this is really well reflected also if we think about how they're all related to each other in a phylogenetic tree. Um, as well, if we this is this is a, a chart showing all the different sizes of our plankton. So our on the left here in our rows are the different major groups. So we have our smallest at the top with viruses. And then at the very bottom, we have our largest zooplankton, things like medusae and siphonophores. And so here at the top, we have our different categories where we talk about plankton. And again, so we're talking about the animals. So we're going to be focusing on some of these larger groups here, the copepods, the hydromedusae, the shrimps, and the jellyfish here that make up some of our larger plankton in the bottom three rows. And I guess I mentioned there's really a large diversity of groups with the plankton. And so we clearly see this when we look at a phylogenetic tree. So I know for many of you, this probably is a little overwhelming, but I don't want to be. So just sit back and relax. My point here is just to show some of the different things, some of the ways they're different related to each other. So for example, we're gonna talk about tenophores, which are at the top, cnidarians, We'll talk a little bit about ketignas, which are airworms. There's microcrustaceans called copepods, that little blue guy is an example of one, and even pelagic snails, which is that pink dude there at the very bottom. So really they span a wide variety of our phylogenetic trees. So a number of different phyla are represented here. All right, so let's start with our first thing on the list, why plankton are fascinating, and this was actually hot off the presses. You guys may have seen it in your Facebook feeds. Uh, there was a recent discovery um, by the Schmidt Ocean Institute in, uh, during a deep water dive off of the coast of Australia that they recorded the, what they think is the longest animal on earth. Um, and so that's what the image you're looking at here. This is a single, um, I guess, cohesive animal. Um, we're gonna see that that's a little bit of a mis misnomer because, and in fact, what they took a picture of is a type of um, jellyfish called a siphonophore. Now, siphonophores are actually colonial animals. And what that means is, is that they're comprised of many individuals that each do a, a, a specific job. So here we're looking at a picture of a siphonophore and we can see kind of in a very um, kind of coarse way some of the different parts of this animal. So on the left, we see the, these circular structures. These are the swimming bells. That's how it propels itself. And then these long kind of spaghetti string tentacles that are cascading down like a curtain, those are its feeding tentacles. If we look up close, we can see that in fact, this animal is really a colonial animal of many individuals working together. And so 
yes, while they took a picture of the longest um, kind of single uh, uh, collective animal on Earth, it's a, not quite the single you know, largest individual. That being said, it is quite impressive. And so to give you a sense of the scale of this animal, if we look at a, uh, a, a picture of a blue whale, we see that usually they can live grow up to about 100 feet long. And that's about the same length as of almost three school buses. So this is a not to scale, but this is just to give you an idea again, if this animal was 150 feet long, it's about one and a half blue lengths, blue whale lengths long. So that's a pretty big animal, very impressive. So that's the first way that zooplankton are amazing. They are some of the largest animals on earth. They can be. All right, well, number two. What's the number two way? Well, the number two thing that's really fascinating about zooplankton is that they have these pelagic snails, these are mollusks, called pteropods that have been shown to swim in a similar way like hummingbirds. And so we're gonna take a moment here and watch this video. We're gonna see how these snails have adapted their foot to flit through the water like ontherial wings. So that was a great video kind of showing uh, the pteropods swimming in kind of some different environments and a little about their ecology. Um, okay, so number three on our list, if I can get it to advance, oops, is red zooplankton in the heart of darkness. So um, if you know, you've, um, Gone through your science classes, you know that the visible light spectrum is Roy G. Biv, right? We have red light that goes all the way to kind of violet or ultra, ultraviolet light. And so the, what we're looking at, two pictures here are two examples of a jellyfish and an amphipod that live in the very deep sea. So these guys 
are living at depths of around <clears throat> um, uh, of around 1,000 meters, which is equivalent to about 3,000 feet. And you can see that they both have this really intense red coloring or pigmentation to them. And you might think to yourself that, you know, if you're trying to hide from a predator, being so vibrant is probably not the best idea. But perhaps what you don't know that is that when light from the sun hits the surface of the ocean, the wavelengths actually attenuate at different levels. So the red wavelengths actually are lost first. We see this here in the spectrum looking at that. So red light actually doesn't really even reach beyond 50 meters. Um, and blue light actually travels the furthest down um, into the depths of the ocean. And so because of this, because there's no red, red light at the bottom of the ocean, what really happens when you look at organisms that have that kind of deep red pigmentation is that when we put surface light on an animal on this amphipod, this is what we see. We see this really vibrant, again, color. But at depth, this is what the amphipod looks like for the predator. He looks completely black. And so his camouflage is actually really quite adequate to hide from these predators. Um, so we see a lot of examples of deep sea animals that have this deep uh, red coloring um, in order to hide from different predators. Okay, so number four on our left are jet sighting microcrustaceans called copepods. These guys make up over 80% of all the zooplankton in the ocean. They are, occur in every ocean um, on Earth, um, and they are a really important um, food source for larval fishes and other things that we enjoy eating. Um, here we have a picture of a very large, relatively large copepod. He's probably a couple inches long that occurs up in the Arctic um, called Calanus glacius. Now, the these guys are so amazing because what we kind of forget to think about as humans is that these guys are swimming through water, but at that size, at this very small size, because of the viscosity of the water, it doesn't have the same properties that we have when we go swimming in the pool. It actually is more akin for us if we were trying to swim through a pool of, let's say, molasses, right? It's very thick, it's very viscous, it's hard to move. So having these abilities to have swimming velocities that are up to a thousand body lengths per second is quite amazing. Um, these guys can experience some really high g-forces. Um, and so we're going to take a couple of videos and kind of look at one in real time and then second in slow motion to see how these guys swim. And, and again, I want to remind you in these really viscous. So just kind of think about trying to swim and escape from predators uh, if you're swimming in a pool of molasses. All right, so this first video is in real time. And we're going to look, there's a siphon here at the bottom. That's that black straw looking thing here. And we're going to, it's trying to suck up a couple pod. These are the little black guys, these little couple pods here, little critters with the antennas. And so it's trying to suck one up and he's going to escape and you're going to see how fast they can move when they really need to. So you can see that he's really jumping, really jumping up, bam. Look at that, he really can go. All right, so let's do that in slow motion. All right, so this is a video of a similar type of animal, and this, but this is in slow motion, so we kind of see how they swim with their little legs. So impressive, it's like a cheetah. He's really going for it. Look at that. So just to remind you, this camera is a high-speed camera. So these images are slowed down by 270 times from real life speed. It's really quite impressive. All right, so now we're at number five, and I like to call this one old souls, jellies that predate sponges or periphera. So 
if you might dig back into your, you know, maybe high school or even middle school science when you were learning about the tree of life, um, uh, usually sponges or periphera were kind of the anchor point for metazoan uh, for trees. But recent work has found that a type of jellyfish called a tenophore, which is in their own phylum, they're separate from idarians, which are kind of your classic jellyfish, the ones that um, uh, you would find on the beach that sting you. Tenophores don't have any stinging tentacles. Um, they have evolved actually evolutionary before sponges. Um, this was some work that was done by Ken Helenich um, and his collaborators. Um, and they found that tenophores actually have a much older lineage than the periphera. So this is a, a graph of, of the basic tree pulled from their paper. And so what they found was that the tenophores developed uh, musculature and neurons earlier than what we find for periphera, which is the sponges and things like placozoa. Uh, that's quite amazing. So again, we're talking like they have been around for about between five and 600 million years. So these are really kind of robust and resilient creatures. All right, so we're gonna be on a Tino for kick here and I'm not gonna lie, these are some of my favorite jellyfish. I work with them during my PhD study and they're just the coolest little guys. Um, what we're looking at here is a, a type of uh, tenophore. He's in the class Muta, which means he doesn't have any tentacles. It's a Baroe. Um, and uh, another really neat thing about uh, tenophores is that they are the largest animals on earth to be powered by cilia. So if you might remember from looking at like things about studying bacteria, bacteria can be powered by other flagella or cilia. Cilia are these little appendages that stick off and they use them to move around. And so if we zoom in and we look at this purple circle, we see that, oh, there seems to be some little things sticking off there that are beating. So let's zoom in and take a look. What we're looking at here are the tenophores comb plates. And so tenophores have eight rows of these that beat synchronously to allow them to move through the water. Uh, and so a cilia is the same organelle, again, as I mentioned earlier, that's used by smaller organisms like bacteria to move around. So here in the bottom left corner, we see kind of a conceptual diagram with a bacteria, his flagella, the long flagella are kind of streaming up behind them, and then the little hair-like cilia are all covering the surface of the bacteria. So we're gonna look at a video of how these cilia beat in slow motion. Um, it's just, and uh, they use actually alternating pressure versions around the, each individual plate for these to move. It's a quite a fascinating mechanism. So let's look at these at slow time, in, um, in, a, in slow motion here. So these are really long plates and we see them beating asynchronously along the each row. One thing that researchers have found is that when they put plumes of dye in front of these tenophores, the hydrodynamics of these teen rows, they actually create um, fluid uh, currents that move prey particles down their body and towards their mouths. So with each bead of these teen rows, they're moving particles that may be in the water that they can eat towards their mouth. So again, these are individual team plates that we see beating, and these are a version of cilia. So again, these are some of the, uh, the largest version of cilia that are on Earth. Okay. All right, so another really neat thing about Tina is, is that the beating of their teen rows creates these beautiful kind of disco style light shows. And so we'll take a look at that. This is why one of their why they're one of the favorites in Aquaria. They really are quite beautiful and relaxing to look at.
So here we're looking at an example of a lobe atina for the lobes are these long things that are coming out the back end here. And then the particles that you see in the middle of the animal, those are the food particles that they've consumed. It's very hypnotic. All right, well, we're gonna pause this and move on to our next thing on the list. Okay, so, you know, the Tina fours are a bit famous. People have seen them in the aquarium, um, but kind of the one of the unsung heroes of the plankton, even among zooplankton ecologists, are a group of animals that belong in the phylum Chetidnatha or generally we just call them ketonats. They're more commonly known as arrow worms. Um, somebody in the chat said that their favorite superhero was Wolverine. He's pretty good too. I have to admit that I'm a Hugh, Hugh, uh, Hugh Jackman fan. And so he's pretty badass. Um, but you know he doesn't exist in real life, but the arrow worm is a pretty close analog and I'm gonna show you how. Okay, so this is an arrow worm. And to give you a sense of scale, He's about the size of a paperclip. This is a very conceptual paperclip, but I double checked on how large, how long paperclips can be. And an arrow worm is about the length of a paperclip. So it gives you a sense of, you can see him with your naked eye, but he can't swim very well against the currents. All right, so how are they like wolverines? Well, arrow worms are ambush predators that grab onto their prey with fangs. Where are these fangs, you think? Well, let's zoom in and look closer on his head. Okay, so if we zoom in, we see that he has these um, pr protruding teeth or fang-like things coming off of his head. And this is how he grabs his prey. Now, one thing that's really neat about these is that they're quite hard. In fact, the reason that they're so hard is that they're tipped with silicone, they're chitinous, so they're made of the same material as your fingernails, but they're tipped with silicone and zinc, which is a metal. So essentially what we're looking at is an ambush predator that's like a lion of the plankton, the one things I like to call it, that has these metal covered fangs. So he's essentially the wolverine of the plankton. He's pretty, um, and so one of the reasons this is one of my favorite uh, types of plankton out there. Okay, number eight, a collector of fine things, larvations. So larvations are quite fascinating um, because they are actually the most closely related to us. They, um, in terms of uh, their phonology or the evolutionary history, um, they have a notochord. Um, so they're almost vertebrates. What we're looking at here is a picture of a larvation in his house. They, what they have is, um, I'm going to show you a picture of a naked larvation here. I'm going to advance in just a second, and then I'm going to toggle back. So larvations, this is one without his house. They have this really kind of big head that almost looks like alien. And then they have this tail that comes off at a 90 degree angle from their head um, that they beat to create a water current. And so at the nape of their neck here, they actually have these glands that they secrete to create these very intricate houses that have these different compartments. And so that's what you're seeing an image of here. So this animal, though while it's a still image, he's beating his tail to create a water current that is passing water through first this outer house that's collecting particles, much like those pelagic snails that we talked about a little bit earlier. And then going through uh, a series of finer filters um, it's through these two cones here, and then ultimately concentrating particles for him to eat in his mouth. Here's a bigger image of what an apodicularian house looks like. So again, we've zoomed out here. So these can be quite large. Um, um, and uh, in the deep sea, around probably um, 800 to 1,000 meters. So that's again, around about 3,000 feet. Some of these houses can span almost uh, three meters or about nine feet. 
um, in diameter. They're just really impressive. And so again, he's collecting all these particles and then progressively filtering them through these tubes here for him to eat. Um, when these houses get clogged, so you know, eventually, just like your your vacuum cleaner filter or anything else, right, or your air purify filter, eventually they're going to clog with too many particles and they can't do their job very well anymore. So what this guy does is he sheds his house, he just disconnects it, and it sinks to the floor. So it represents a really important uh, mechanism that particles get um, basically moved to the deep sea. And when he does that, then he just makes a new one. Okay, so our last guy is number nine and 10, and he gets two because he has two really cool characteristics about him. So this one was a little bit of a cheat because he's not technically zooplankton, but we do tend to pick up the mantis strip in our nets, sometimes when we trawl too close to the bottom, and also his um, larval form likes to hang out on the plankton. So it's close enough for me to include him in our list of the 10 amazing things that microscopic animals can do. So he's not quite microscopic, but at one point in his life, he was. All right, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at something called a mantis shrimp. Um, and he's famous for a couple different things. First up, he can see in not, he can see in 16 different colors. The other thing that's fascinating about this little guy is he packs one of the meanest punches in the animal kingdom. He has these two appendages um, here um, in front of their body that he can basically punch out at the same velocity as a gunshot from a 22 caliber rifle. So if we had this ability to put this in perspective, we could, even at a tenth of this speed, throw a baseball into the orbit and escape Earth's gravity. Essentially, this little guy, he, within less than 3,000 seconds, can strike prey with 1,500 newtons of force. It's super impressive. And when you're moving that fast, a couple things can happen. First, you can create light. It's called sonoluminescence, which is amazing. And second, you actually move so fast that you create a vacuum by destroying water and it's a, you create like a, it's called a cavitation. So we're gonna watch this video of this mantis stripe, mantis shrimp striking.
All right. So we're going to pause that video there. And that is, oops, my, oops. And so to just to summarize here, um, the Amanda shrimp he can strike with the fastest speed in the animal kingdom um, at the speed of a 22 gun uh, shotgun, fast enough that he destroys water and creates a cavitation bubble. So for a little crustacean, he packs quite a large punch. Well, we are at the end of our list. We've looked at how um, uh, shrimp can strike and sea butterflies can fly. We've explored how copepods can jump at up to 1,000 body lengths per second and the amazing red pigmentation of things that live at the deep sea. And so I would be happy to answer questions you may have about plankton. Um, I'm real nerdy about it, as you can probably tell. Um, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. So with that, I will leave you with this question slide. All right, thank you so much, Kelly. Can we get you to turn your camera on so people can see yes. you as you're answering questions? Uh-huh, for sure. Try to turn my light on so people can see me. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. There were some things that I had forgotten and some new things that I learned tonight. And I think we, um, your audience, we have new superheroes. <laughs> As we're waiting for uh, people to busily type their questions into the question box, um, <laughs> I, huh, how am I going to phrase this? I don't want to start a scientific debate tonight, but I would like to have a scientific conversation. <laughs> okay, that's a loaded way to start something. <laughs> I'm on pins so and needles. <laughs> So uh, if if you don't know it, we now have a um, a sponge person at Lone Oh Pond. no! Oh no! There's controversy. <laughs> there's debate. <laughs> and we we also now have some sponge lovers in our in our audience. But um, so so <laughs> I will preempt this and say that the the paper by Moroz with Ken Helenich did create quite a stir. And so there has been back and forth about whether their results are robust. But I will say that I think it's more an example of how science progresses and should progress, right? Someone presents an idea and then people get really excited and they try to go out to see if their hypothesis is supported or not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, for those of you who are attending off screen, um, this was, uh, we got a question from Dr. Archer, um, more of a statement, really, um, kind of debating whether um, tenophores are the basal metazoan, um, and she's making a case for, you know, why sponges may take that role now. <laughs> I think we have a room for a healthy a healthy debate. <laughs> I so want to be at Lumcon when you two have that debate. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> we could even probably broadcast it if you wanted to. <laughs> How dare you, ma'am? <laughs> You've seen it here live, people. <laughs> oh, okay, back to business. Um, we have a question. I think this goes back to your Tino four slides. And there was a question about um, food being lit up, but I don't think it was the food that was looking lit up. Can you kind of um, clarify what was going on with the Tino four cilia and why so many colors were being displayed? Oh, yeah. So essentially, they're um, translucent. It's like cellophane. Right, if you guys have played with that kind of like material you get for parties and stuff, that's fun. And it's just iridescent. And so it reflects the light. Um, and the comment that I made about the food was, you know, if you try to think about um, when people have done dye experiments, so what they do is they put dye in the water to help them visualize how the water is flowing around the animal, right? 
And so if, um, so those, those teens are beating and they're creating a different fluid structure, right? They're moving water around the animal. And so what people have seen when they actually kind of visualize how that water is moving is that not only is the animal, does the water being pushed behind to kind of propel the animal forward, it's also being encapsulated in these vortices that kind of push water towards their mouth. So any prey particles or food particles that are in that water would be naturally kind of pushed towards the mouth to be eaten. Perfect. Um, Tally has a question about the, and I'm gonna get this wrong because I, I pronounce this wrong all the time. The larvacine? The larvations. Yes, the larvations, that's right. I'll never get that one. Um, <laughs> Uh, is being asked whether the the house, if it shed, does the house benefit other life forms or play a key role in any other specific bioecosystem before it completely degrades? That is an excellent question. Mm -hmm. So yes, it does play a role for other organisms. So one, the first, the way that it does is that the house is collecting all these organic particles, right? So they're energy rich particles. Um, and so because it's also got a gel like structure, it becomes a microhabitat for things like bacteria and other microbial creatures um, as it's in this water, in the water. Um, and so in that way, essentially it's collecting even more kind of carbon rich material um, that little, little other animals can feed on. Um, and so as this house sinks through the water depths, uh, we can imagine that the uh, relative availability of food sources becomes increasingly scarce as our water depth increases, right? So what we're happening here is that these particular houses kind of represent these little packages of food that are making their way to the, to the depths. And so they're gonna be consumed as they go down. Perfect, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, we also have another question about the house. Um, and the question is from Lindsay, and she wants to know if there are a way to protect it from predators. No, they are extremely fragile. Um, I actually try to do my master's work on these kind of animals, and because um, they're even common in coastal waters, we can, if you were lucky, you could scoop them up, for example, off the coast of Louisiana or even Florida. But um, the if they get disturbed even a little bit, they just drop their houses. They just shed them and uh, and then try to hide. Um, and another question about these same amazing animals. Notice I purposely left out the word. Uh, <laughs> um, we have a question from Michelle who would like to know um, if microplastics affect them in any way, even with the house. You know, that's a great question. And I think it's an unanswered one. Um, they have, I, I left this out. They have the ability to, their mesh is so fine. Um, work by a friend of mine, Kelly Sutherland, has shown that they can filter out almost individual bacteria cell particles. And so they, they would certainly capture microplastics in their feeding mucus house nets things. Um, I don't think anyone has actually explored to, the, to date what the impact of microplastics is on their feeding. And that would be a really interesting area of study. And the reason for that is that, for example, off the coast of Florida, this animal is actually a preferred prey item for um, fishes that we really enjoy eating, like uh, billfishes, sailfishes and things like that, mm. and tuna. And so if, if microplastics are harming the larvations, that would ultimately affect some of you know, the larger consumers that are a little bit more charismatic. Perfect. Um, we're moving on to mantis shrimp since you brought them up. Um, <laughs> mantis shrimp actually came up a few times with favorite superhero questions. So I'm excited to see those in your talk. Um, but we have a question about whether a mantis shrimp, if they strike a human, could it harm us? Yeah, I think I'm not sure if you caught that in the video with the gentleman from England, but he said that the mantis shrimp um, that they were working with had hit his boss and had split the thumb down at the bone. Yeah, I've actually seen um, one spear of fish in our in our trawl catch table on the Acadiana once, um, just after I put it down. <laughs> <laughs> I was 
was once young and naive too. <laughs> it's okay. They're right up there with blue crabs. There's just so much anger in such a small package. Yeah, you know, you know what they do say about oysters too, right? That they're um let's see, what was that saying? Uh they're like sharks without the element of surprise. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they'll oh, get you. Yeah. Ya. yeah. <laughs> All right, Leslie has a question about how far mantis shrimp actually live in the water. Like what their habitat is? Um, how far down? How what depth do you find them? Hmm. I'm pretty sure they're um uh uh well they're benthic. Um hmm. I'm gonna okay, I have to do some more research because I'm not sure about the deep ones but I definitely know that they live on the shelf, which is 200 meters or 600 feet or more shallower. That sounds about right from what I've read. If I remember, I, but I don't remember things, obviously. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got distracted by a question. Um, so, ooh. Dr. Archer said she would be happy to debate that with you anytime at the Marine Center with beverages. <laughs> I think beverages would be required. <laughs> Dr. Mary Miller also said she would like to be part of that conversation as well. Um, I will bring my I will bring my gloves to throw them down and also the gauntlet. <laughs> You have disparaged what, my honor. <laughs> that's what Lindsay said. She says, ooh, gloves off. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, we're starting something tonight. Um, Susie is asking about where she can find an ID card for Gulf of Mexico zooplankton, and I would be very interested in that answer as well. There is a couple good books. So the easy book to get a hold of is Johnson and Allen. It's so Plankton of the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. It's a paperback. It's got like a green cover on it. Um, it's got the big guys in it. So that's usually my first go to, particularly when I'm training students. If you really want to get deep into it, um, this book is out of print. But there's a two volume set called Zooplankton of the South Atlantic. I'm gonna I'm gonna mispronounce this because it's a Russian by Poltowski. Um, and it's very comprehensive. But that's just not for the Gulf of Mexico, that's for all of the Southern Atlantic. Gotcha. Yeah. Great. Um, Jason has been using his time very wisely um, in isolation. And uh, he said he recently ran some water from a canal in his neighborhood through a coffee filter to concentrate plankton, and it was awesome. That's pretty um, smart. <laughs> like I said, using his time wisely. Um, his question is, what are some cool freshwater plankton he should look for? Ooh, that's a good one. So freshwater plankton, they're quite, they're less diverse than their marine counterparts. Um, so you're gonna find some calanoids, so bigger copepods. Uh, another cruel creature to look for is um, a, a chlordocerin, like bos bosmina. It's a little dude, he's got like these little whiskers that come out and he's filtering particles. Um, and then if you're lucky, you might come across a freshwater jellyfish called Crespa de Custa. They exist in lakes all across the United States. Perfect. Um, oh, um, from Dr. Abigail Bacchus from Lumcon. Um, she says, hey, Kelly. Hey. Um, <laughs> uh, she's seen lobe tinafores eat each other in a small dish when she was out to sea. Do they actually do this in nature? Or did I just get stuck in the did I get stuck in the mouth of other of the other because they were pushed together in the net? I'm sorry. I think it's more the latter. Sorry, I got a little bit of sniffle here. Um I've never seen them in captivity. I'm gonna sneeze. No, I'm not. No, no what I no. Hang on. Bless you. I've never seen them in captivity eat each other. Uh, the Barowi, which I saw a picture of, he's actually, he eats the lobe jellies. Um, he's, that animal is essentially his one giant mouth. 
Um, but not, I don't know, I don't think the, no, the load guys, it must have just been stuck one or one another. So. Um, Ross is asking if jellyfish have a life cycle. They absolutely do, but what kind of jellyfish? Cause that's a big term. All right, well then I'll tackle the classics then the Nigerian. <laughs> So when we think about jellyfish, we usually think about medusae, right? They have the body and the big tentacles and things like that. And so um, for a subset of those guys, the, the ones that we often see in the coast, they're generally like scyphozoans, the things like um, three figure eights or the sea nettles. And they have what we call a bipart life history or two parts. And so because they're in the phylum Nideria, they're actually related to corals. And so many of you probably know the corals have are polyps, right? They live on substrate. And so the jellyfish also have a polyp stage where they need to be attached to some sort of substrate. Um, and so the, the Medusa stage is actually their kind of pelagic sexual phase where they release gamete, gametes and, and then they, you know, merge together. And then these gametes will sometimes fall out of the water column and actually settle onto a substrate and then grow into a polyp. Polyps can either produce by asexually by budding, so they'll just kind of pop off a new polyp to the side, um, like you clone a tree, or they can produce um, a juvenile jellyfish called a phyra, um, which ultimately then turn back into that pelagic medusa stage. Other jellyfish like tinafores, they don't have a, um, a benthic stage. They produce entirely in the water column. Perfect. Um, lots of questions coming in. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I'm glad that I stimulated so much excitement. <laughs> you may have already kind of answered this, but um, I'll just ask it again. Um, so Mary's asking, what is your favorite zooplankton to study? Mm, it's got to be Tina Fours. I've just got a big soft spot for them. Yeah. They're kind of like the underdog, right? They just They are. Though recently I'm finding that Keating Nass are even more of an underdog than Tina Fours. So hmm. I know. I have a I'm gonna butt in here with a question, but when the property of Lumcon floods, we often find that like three days later we get a Tina Four outbreak in our front pond when it wasn't there before the flood, are they just getting trapped in the pond? And why don't we see them like right after the flood? So there's two possible theory, hypotheses for that. So one would be infection, right? They're coming in on that flood tide and then they're getting trapped in there. But is the pond, the pond's brackish, right? It's not mm -hmm. fresh water. Yeah. What's probably more likely is that they're just probably hanging out and hibernating, not hibernating, that's the wrong word to use. They really like to chill out in like shallow areas of marshes and they wait for conditions to be favorable. But I think it's probably happening is that the flooding probably stimulates production in that pond and stir things up. And so all of a sudden their food availability probably shoots up and they're like, yeah, let's party. Gotcha. Um, there's a question about jellyfish tentacles and does the length of the tentacles have anything to do with the environment they're hunting in or the preferred type of prey what determines the length of a tentacle hmm i think it has more to do with the environment that they're hunting in so we have a i think the good example is that kind of that picture of the saphonophore that i used and we talked about the colonial animals and we saw that the tentacle was very long that animal was in the pretty deep sea, right? So when you're in a, a parcel of water where food is fairly scarce, you, not to use a cliche, but you need to cast a wide net, right? So we also mm -hmm. see that tree was on a deep sea team of boards that have tentacles. They really, they essentially like to flow them out. Uh, you can't see my arms here, but think about them essentially just kind of wafting out and they drop these tentacles and they're just trying to collect whatever prey items that come along. Perfect. Um, we do have a very technical question from Dr. Stumpf, so I'm going to send that to you in an email to answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, Dr. Stumpf, if you're still listening, 
we'll get that answer for you to your question. Um, but that brings us to the end of tonight. Um, Jason, uh, who is the person who filtered plankton, he's, I just got to quote this. It says, freshwater jellyfish, I've never heard of such a thing. And it's all caps and exclamation point. Y'all just made my week. Yay. <laughs> So that was great. I love having a plank another plankton enthusiast in the audience. Um, for those of you who are listening from home, do not forget that if you attend 10 of our LumCon science talks, you will get a Pelican Challenge coin, a research vessel Pelican Challenge coin. Some of you are well on your way to earning that challenge coin. Those of you who just started, 10, 10 talks, join us live, and then you'll earn your own challenge coin. So let your friends, family, and everybody know that every Thursday at, at 7 o'clock Central Time, you can join us for another amazing marine science chat. Um, you'll get a confirmation email 24 hours from now, and it will have a link to our webpage with all of the talk information. Next week's talk is going to also be amazing. We're leaving the realm of plankton and, uh, and sponges. I threw sponges in there, Dr. Archer. Um, and we're gonna be talking about animal social behavior with Dr. Guillaume Riku from Lone That's so, gonna be super uh, exciting, yeah. It is going to be super exciting. So please, um, Join us for next week's talk and uh, get another notch in your in your um, trek to a challenge coin. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Dr. Robinson, of course, always a pleasure to debate science with you. <laughs> always fun, Mert. It was great. It was great being part of this. Thank you. You are so welcome. Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.